Hello, this is Michael Brown, president of the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe. I'm speaking to you today from my office in the historic El Delirio campus on Garcia Street in Santa Fe. It's my great pleasure to host this scholar colloquium, the fifth in our fall series. Dimitri Brown is a PhD candidate in the Department of History at the University of California, Davis, and he is SIR's 2021 Katrin H. Lamont Fellow. Just as a personal footnote, uh, his grandmother, Rena Swensel of Santa Clara Pueblo, was a, 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 a Katrin Lamont Fellow. She held the same fellowship 25 years ago. So it's a special event to have Dimitri speaking to us today. So I'll do the handoff to Dimitri's talk and then rejoin you for questions afterwards. Hello, and thank you for the introduction. Thank you also to everybody at SAR and everybody who helps make SAR possible. This has been a wonderful experience for me to come here to this campus to be able to stay in Santa Fe and try to finish up my dissertation. Uh, the campus is beautiful. The staff who I've met have been uh, really nice, really supportive. It's also been great to meet the fellow scholars, the resident scholars, um, and learn about their work. And I'm excited to learn more about their work in the coming months. Um, I also, I don't know why I didn't realize this at the time that I was applying, but um, Paul was giving us an introductory tour and we were walking through the library and the, the main offices and I noticed a photograph of the group scholars. Um, they have all the photographs of group scholars up on the wall and I saw my grandmother's name, Rena Swensel, and I looked up and there she was uh, in the photograph and uh, standing right behind her was my aunt, Tessie Naranjo. And I realized that in 1995 to 1996, my grandmother, in partnership with my great aunt and my great uncle, held this same fellowship that I hold now. Uh, so there's something really special about coming back to SAR, um, not coming back, but uh, following in their footsteps in a certain way. I also realized that one of the sources that I've been using to understand gender in the Tewa Pueblos was my grandmother's SAR colloquium talk, which is what I'm giving right now. Um, I'm going to come back to my grandmother throughout various points in this presentation, but before I get too far, I just wanna give you a brief roadmap of where I'll be going in this talk. So first I wanna describe my title and its three main terms because that will provide some useful introductory context, especially for those of you less familiar with the Pueblos and modern New Mexico history. After that, I wanna go through my personal history of my coming to this subject, uh, sort of the early research process, and then I'll get into some of the moments and aspects of the work itself. So the title of my dissertation is Tewa Pueblos at the Dawn of Atomic Modernity. There are three key terms here that I want to briefly explain. The first is Tewa Pueblos. In northern New Mexico, these are the indigenous nations and communities of Santa Clara, San Ildefonso, Okeowinge, Tesuki, Nambe, and Pewaukee. As Tewa Pueblos, they are linguistically and culturally distinct from the Tewa, Toa, Karis, and Zuni Pueblos. And while all of these pueblos maintain historical and contemporary relationships with each other, I speak of a Tewa world in this talk and in my dissertation, one partly to open dialogues with the work of other scholars like Alfonso Ortiz and Samuel Dewey, who have written about a Tewa world or Tewa worlds. Two, partly because of the Tewa pueblos historical, cosmological, and linguistic proximity to each other and three, because the Tewa Pueblos had the closest and most intimate interactions with Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project, which brings me to my next term. And I will come back to the idea of Don, I promise, uh, but let's jump to atomic modernity. So in late 1942, J. Robert Oppenheimer, General Leslie Groves, and others were searching for a site to establish the scientific headquarters for the Manhattan Project, and they agreed on Los Alamos which at the time was a boys' ranch school. The Manhattan Project's mission was to build an atomic weapon before the Nazis or Axis powers could do so, 
Historians have pinpointed different moments as the birth of the atomic age, but wherever or whenever that was, the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos played an enormous role in this seminal moment of world history. I use modernity here both in reference to the increasingly argued point that Native people have found ways to carve out their own meanings in and of modernity, and in reference to the idea that various symbols of modernity, including the railroad, tourism, and automobiles, all made their way into the table world. The idea here is that although the Manhattan Project brought unique local changes, it was also part of a larger pattern of incursion and accommodation. Finally, Don. Don is a useful metaphor here because Don, the sun, and primordial fires have all been deeply connected with and have helped us make sense of the atomic age and grapple with the intensity of atomic explosions from the first time one occurred at the Trinity test site, also in New Mexico. One simple way to demonstrate this point is just to look at uh, book titles, which some of you may be familiar with. So we have books like Dawn Over Zero, The Day the Sun Rose Twice, American Prometheus, By the Bomb's Early Light, and many others. As another example, Harry Truman's press release about the first use of an atomic bomb against Japan noted that scientists had harnessed the power of the sun. In a slight variation on this idea, we can use Tewa Pueblo notions and stories about the sun to shed new light on this common metaphorical use. I won't go into too much detail here, but the importance of the sun in the Tewa world cannot be overstated. And Don itself is a particularly meaningful moment in stories, prayers, and dances. Now that we've gone through the key terms in the title, Tewa Pueblos at the Dawn of Atomic Modernity, I'll just explain briefly that this dissertation focuses on the relationship between the Tewa Pueblos and Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project. At a glance, Tewa maids and other laborers traveled up to Los Alamos by bus. They shopped at the army commissary, um, and they sometimes even formed friendships with the scientists and their families, many of whom bought pottery from the Pueblos or traveled down to the villages to watch dance ceremonies and enjoy feasts in people's homes. On another level, when we start thinking about what the Manhattan Project means in the table world, making the conscious decision to contextualize the Manhattan Project from Tewa perspectives and Tewa histories, we start to see an array of philosophical connections and points of dialogue that help open deeper questions about science, about place, and about the way we tell history. So to try to restate as clearly as I can the claims that I'm making in this work, one is that a Tewa history of the Manhattan Project is possible, despite the idea that silence predominates in historical sources or that it's difficult to access Pueblo perspectives. And that not only is it possible, but it opens new ways of thinking and holding dialogue about history, modernity, and indigenous survival. Second, one of the most profound strengths of the Tewa Pueblos is and has been the ability to accommodate incursions. This historical trait points us toward a way of viewing native history where we see native communities as integral wholes that encompass, absorb, and refract colonialist incursions rather than as entities that exist within colonialist frameworks. The next thing that I think is important to discuss is the process of this work and my personal history with the subject, which begins with my grandmother, who along with her siblings grew up in Santa Clara during this pivotal moment of Pueblo and world history in the 1940s. As I was growing up, my grandmother told me certain stories that stayed with me, and I didn't quite realize the gift that they were until I started thinking about my dissertation. In one story, her father, my great-grandfather, Michael Naranjo, worked as a carpenter at Los Alamos and one day he wanted to take his kids up to work. So he put them all in his truck and he tried to drive up, but at the gate, Los Alamos had a security gate, he was turned away by the guards because the children did not have passes. In another story, my grandmother's mother, Rose Naranjo, tried to make a little extra money by renting a room in her Pueblo home out to a white Los Alamos worker. 
The tribal leadership at the time did not support this situation, and the dispute over the white renter almost verged into violence. Finally, I just want to share that after I graduated college, my grandmother gave me her copy of American Prometheus, which is a biography of J. Robert Oppenheimer, the head physicist and director of the Manhattan Project. I remember sitting in her house in Santa Clara Pueblo after I'd read it, and when she asked me what was my favorite part of the book, I said it was how captivating Op Oppenheimer was, um, his quirks, his mysticalness, the sort of aura that surrounded him. And then she told me that her favorite part was that so much of the book had taken place right up the road. And it struck me that I had barely noticed that fact while I was reading the book. As I started to read more about the Manhattan Project, alongside sifting through my grandmother's archive, I came across what felt like eerie parallels between the way my grandmother talked about Tewa philosophical concepts and the way physicists, especially Robert Oppenheimer, talked about atomic physics. This next slide offers one example of those parallels, along with a map from Joseph Masco's book, Nuclear Borderlands, that is very helpful in showing the proximity between the Pueblos and Los Alamos. In an interview in the 1940s, Robert Oppenheimer explained the notion of complementarity in this way. He said, quote, one of the first things that the student of atomic structure must come to understand is the principle of complementarity, which recognizes that various ways of talking about physical experience may each have validity and may each be a necessary and adequate description of the physical world and may yet stand in a mutually contradictory relationship to each other. Meanwhile, we have notions in the Tewa world, like the Nansipu. This is my grandmother's articulation of that concept. Quote, the Bupinge, or plaza, contains the literal center of the earth, the Nansipu, which translates as the belly root of the earth. Each Pueblo's cosmos encircles the Nansipu, and the surrounding mountains where the sky and earth touch are the boundaries of the well-organized spaces in which people, animals, and spirits live. So here we have the idea that each Pueblo has a very distinct center of the universe. And at the same time, each Pueblo recognized that other Pueblos had their own centers of the universe. And this coexistence of multiple centers seemed to express the point Robert Oppenheimer was making about physics. There's one more quotation from my grandmother I'd like to bring up that I think helps drive this parallel home. She wrote, quote, truth is not absolute in the Pueblo world. There is never one truth. The world, the cosmos, the whole is multifaceted and expresses many truths at once. Simultaneous levels of existence, as told in Pueblo emergence stories, are a part of daily reality and understanding. Holes, the cosmos, the community, are what must be experienced because parts, which can be holes in their own context, give only a partial sense of understanding. There is then no set truth because contexts always change given any particular stance or reality. Because holes are ever-changing, the effort to perceive holes is unending, therefore absolute truth is never attained. Eventually, I came to understand the parallels between Oppenheimer's words and my grandmother's as something that could help me frame what I wanted to write, which was, which is, a Tewa history of the Manhattan Project. And to understand that this history was not only possible, but that it was, to borrow a word from Oppenheimer, necessary. So often the predominant theme of scholarly discussions of the relationship between the Tewa Pueblos and the Manhattan Project is the idea of silence, that Pueblo perspectives are out of reach or that we'll never know what they thought about the project. On the other hand, scholars sometimes write about the Pueblo experience during Los Alamos as a sort of prelude to the idea of nuclear colonialism in the Southwest and the legacy of environmental degradation. Those are important stories, but the one I'm trying to tell here is different. What I'm trying to do is center Tewa contexts for and perspectives on the Manhattan Project. But what does that mean to do that? For the rest of this presentation, I'm going to detail a series of contexts that have helped me frame the project. The first is Tewa story, 
which is a theme throughout the work. The second is World War II and sovereignty. And the third is the connection between science, architecture, and place. So the first context I want to discuss is story. Many historians and anthropologists who study not only the Pueblos, but other native groups give attention to origin myths and point out to varying degrees how those myths have some sort of explanatory power. What I'm trying to do in my dissertation is to look beyond those origin myths into the entire world or universe created and inhabited by all sorts of Tewa stories. In these stories, we encounter figures like coyote, we see gophers and rabbits, we come across magical pinyon seeds, and in accumulating these stories through various sources, we start to uncover deeper lines of thought, what we might consider kernels of truth that are at once universal, but that also represent uniquely Tewa ways of knowing. I wanna talk about two themes or motifs in particular that come across in these stories because they help us understand the meaning of the Manhattan Project in the Tewa world. The first is the theme of rebirth, and the second is what I'm calling the newcomer motif. There's one beautiful little story of a woman who gives birth to a pot, water jar boy, or sengbe and yuke. The pregnancy and birth of water jar boy are meant to symbolize the intricate connection between clay and Pueblo people. The story goes that one day water jar boy begged his uncle, begged his grandfather to take him hunting and his grandfather reluctantly agreed. But during the hunting trip, there was an accident and Water Jar Boy rolled down a hill and shattered on a rock. But in doing so, he turned into a real boy with arms and legs and a face. So again, in the pot shattering into a real boy, we see the intricate connection between humans and clay. But we also start to pick up on the theme of rebirth. Out of the shattering and breaking of a being, something new and potentially equally beautiful and valuable may be born. So this type of a story becomes very useful for thinking through what the Manhattan Project might mean. There's no question the Manhattan Project is a shattering force. My great uncle, who experienced the changes brought by Los Alamos to Santa Clara as a child, has described Los Alamos as a cultural bomb. But what the story of Water Jar Boy, I think, suggests is that there's room for other narratives and for ambiguity. The other motif that's important to mention in relation to the Manhattan Project is what I'm calling the newcomer motif. Sometimes in Tewa's story, the newcomer is a lonely bat. Sometimes it's coyote. We might even consider Water Jar Boy a newcomer in certain ways. Sometimes the newcomer is an elusive figure known as Montezuma. I think that wherever we see this motif in Tewa's story, it opens another window into the way the Tewa world viewed outside incursions. And the way these stories are told are instructive for several reasons. For one, there's always an initial skepticism or caution directed toward the newcomer, and that caution is seen as a natural and normal feeling. On the other hand, these stories are told in a way that leaves them open to interpretation. As a listener, you can often imagine yourself either as part of the group or as the newcomer. You can allow yourself to sympathize with the experience of being a newcomer. The other thing is that despite the initial and natural caution or skepticism, the newcomer often has something of value that he gives or shares with the group in the form of some sort of innovation or technology. Finally, almost always in these stories, for different reasons, the newcomer leaves with the idea that he, the newcomer, will come back someday, perhaps or probably in a different form. To illustrate this point and the way story connects with history, I wanna put up this image of a, uh, of a train and explain. Um, so this is one of the first engines of the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. And if you bear with me, I think the connection with the Manhattan Project will become clear. Hopefully its name on the side there comes through for all of you, but it says Montezuma. And I find this connection fascinating. I mentioned Montezuma earlier as a key figure in the newcomer motif. Some Tewa oral histories describe him as a powerful outsider who comes to the Pueblos and shows them certain things. New ways of hunting, for example, 
or in this case, visions of the future. One story describes how Montezuma showed the Pueblo people the coming of the railroad. And it is said that because of this prophecy, the Pueblo people had anticipated the railroad and knew that it would one day come. And sure enough, it did. In the late 19th century, the Denver and Rio Grande built a line south from Colorado towards Santa Fe. In the process, it cut through Okeowinge, Santa Clara, and San Ildefonso Pueblos. That line became known as the Chile Line, which has various references around town here in Santa Fe. There's a brewing company called the Chile Line Brew Co., just a couple miles away, for example. The image on the slide represents a remarkable parallel in that the engine, one of the first engines of the Denver and Rio Grande, was named Montezuma. This had nothing to do with the Pueblo stories, but instead reflected the desires of the DNRG president to build the railroad all the way down to Mexico City. What's more, thinking back to the idea of the newcomer motif and the way the newcomer leaves with the sense that someday he'll come back in a different form, in 1941, the Chile line was abandoned. The train conductors left parting gifts and said goodbye to the Pueblos, and the rails were torn up and actually shipped to the Pacific front as part of the war effort. Only a few months later, the Manhattan Project came to Los Alamos. Just to conclude this discussion on the context of story, I'd also like to note that there's something very interesting that happens to time when we take these stories seriously. Sometimes the stories are expressed as prophecy, predicting the future. Sometimes they are taken from the deep past as in origin myths. And sometimes they seem to exist alongside our present reality in a way that allows us to think about newcomers to the Teo Pueblo region, like the Chile Line and like the Manhattan Project, as becoming part of what is already a world of meaning. The next context is a little more material, less philosophical. And that's the idea of the World War and Pueblo sovereignty. The Manhattan Project itself, of course, makes very little sense outside of its being a part of the United States military effort to defeat the Nazis during World War II. But in the Tewa villages, World War II also helps us think about compounding factors of social change in the 1940s. For one, high percentages of Tewa men left their home villages to serve in the World War. In this sense, World War II represents a major shift for the Pueblos as they're swept up in this national mobilization. Men go off to war, the Pueblos buy liberty bonds, aspects of their economies shift towards war production, and in the case of the Tewa Pueblos, all of this sets the background for many women and men taking jobs in Los Alamos. There's a quote from an interview conducted in the early 1990s with a woman from Tezuki Pueblo, a former maid at Los Alamos, that has stuck with me. She said, well, by that time, the Second World War was on. Everything was changing. Then Los Alamos opened, and I couldn't figure out what was going to happen to us. I was more concerned about the war, and then the boys started going to the service. Everybody was running to Los Alamos to work and it was just like a blank. I started working at Los Alamos. We see this idea of a blank over and over in oral histories and other interviews in the sense that Los Alamos or working at Los Alamos often represents the end of a narrative line of thought or the end of a recollection. I'm still working through what to make of this blank and in my last chapter, I'll probably turn towards the idea of acculturation and think about what it means in that context. But for now, I want to discuss how World War II helps us understand the way Pueblo people consider themselves politically, because I don't think we can understand the relationship between the Tewa Pueblos and Los Alamos without recognizing the Pueblos as distinct political entities. So in particular, the draft, raised, the draft for World War II raised questions about Pueblo citizenship and voting rights. The main question centered on the fact that Pueblo people could not vote in the state of New Mexico during the war. And if they couldn't vote, should they still be subject to the draft? What's interesting is that very few Pueblo voices before or during World War II seemed to mind that this was the case, 
voting and citizenship on a national level simply weren't concerns, and I think part of the reason is that political sensibilities were inwardly directed towards their own respective villages, which I would argue, though the language wasn't prominent at the time, was an element or expression of Pueblo sovereignty. When Teo Pueblo leaders or soldiers discussed their reasons for fighting, the dominant idea was protecting Tewa homelands. Fighting for their country meant fighting for the fields and plazas in which they had grown up. There's one other fascinating source that comes out of the context of World War II in 1943. Right about the same time, the Manhattan Project was establishing itself at Los Alamos. So in that year, 1943, there was a congressional hearing about potential dam projects on the Rio Grande River. A proposed bill would have allowed the Bureau of Reclamation to drill in certain sites on Pueblo lands to determine whether or not a dam was feasible. One of the proposed sites was near San Ildefonso, and if constructive, constructed, would have entirely flooded the village of San Ildefonso, parts of Santa Clara, and even some of Española. During the hearing, Pueblo leaders of several Pueblos spoke about their land and its importance. In addition, Margreta Dietrich, the president of the New Mexico Association of Indian Affairs, presented letters collected from Pueblo soldiers abroad whom she had asked to explicitly address the implications of a dam. So here's where we can find Pueblo soldiers articulating why they're fighting and what they're fighting for. But the main reason I think this moment in 1943 is so valuable is that there was no hearing on the Manhattan Project or its regional implications. The Manhattan Project, of course, was top secret and had been granted the means to essentially take over the land it deemed necessary. When the, what the dam hearing allows us to do is imagine how Pueblo leaders might have expressed their concerns about the Manhattan Project if they had been given the opportunity. One of the main conversations during the dam hearing centered on the question of demarcating sacred land. For their part, the senators in the hearing imagined miles of open land marked by a few points that were sacred. They had no problem accepting the idea that the Pueblos had sacred shrines that should not be disturbed. And so they proposed the possibility of mapping out these points and then promising not to dig within a certain radius of the shrines. But that wasn't at all the idea expressed by the Pueblos. Yes, there were and are shrines that should not be disturbed, but the whole expanse in between the shrines was also sacred. Every inch of their land was sacred, and digging should not take place anywhere on it. That was the conviction of the Pueblo leaders. One Pueblo leader, at the end of his testimony, commented on more general differences between Pueblo and Anglo cultural forms of knowledge and purpose. He observed, quote, the white man is looking for something which he, the white man, never lost. He continued, the white man wants to know where the stars are and where the moon is and what everything is. We do not like to do those things. What we want to do is continue leading our life the right way. Now, of course, this statement comes out of a conversation about digging on Pueblo lands, but it also gives us what we might consider a Pueblo critique of the atomic age, which was at the very moment of the dam hearing developing at Los Alamos, well within the sacred mountain ranges that border the Tewa world. With that, I want to move on to the final context of this discussion, which is the connection between science, architecture, and place. One of the chapters of my dissertation asks, what is the meaning of science on the Pajarito Plateau? The Pajarito Plateau is where Los Alamos is located, and it's the Mesa area in between the Rio Grande Valley, where the Teo Pueblos are, and the Jemez mountain range. This is a question that helps us think about the Manhattan Project in relation to the Tewa world, and it helps us think about Tewa survival through and beyond the atomic age. But I'll come back to that idea at the end. The question also highlights a historical precedent for science on the Pajarito Plateau, and by doing so, amplifies the symmetries and dissonances between scientific and Tewa ways of knowing. The historical precedent I'm referring to, perhaps obviously to those of you connected with SAR, 
is the idea of anthropology and archaeology on the Pajarito Plateau. In the early 1900s, Edgar Hewitt's work on the plateau helped solidify Santa Fe's standing in the academic world of anthropology and archaeology. SAR is, of course, part of that legacy. In thinking about the question, what is the meaning of science on the Pajarito Plateau, it's helpful to consider Tewa interactions with Edgar Hewitt and other anthropologists alongside Tewa interactions with Manhattan Project physicists of a later generation. What we learn from this juxtaposition reinforces what the Pueblo leader said during the dam hearing, which was, just to repeat, the white man is looking for something which he never lost. The white man wants to know where the stars are and where the moon is and what everything is. We do not like to do those things. When we're looking at the history of interactions between Hewitt and Tewa people, we have to balance the fact that Pueblo men worked as guides and wage laborers for the anthropologists on one hand, with the idea that what the anthropologists were doing was disturbing things that did not need or did not want to be disturbed. Some oral histories tell of small acts of protest on the part of Tewa workers to hide or rebury things they had uncovered, and also of more dramatic moments where the ancestral spirits of Puye, one of the major ruins on the plateau, revolted against the excavations by causing rocks to fall and hailstorms. With the Pueblo leader's quote from the dam hearing in mind, I want to bring in Robert Oppenheimer to the conversation. One line in particular contrasts with the Pueblo leader's sense that the white man is looking for something which he never lost. According to Oppenheimer, quote, it is a profound and necessary truth that the deep things in science are not found because they are useful, they are found because it was possible to find them. The idea of never having lost anything is actually similar in both quotes, but Oppenheimer, of course, was driven to keep looking. And here I want to dive into Oppenheimer's philosophy of science to lead into a dialogue with Tewa ways of knowing. Oppenheimer envisioned science as a house. He most famously spoke of the house called science in a BBC radio broadcast after the Manhattan Project. He saw science as a steadily growing structure, a house with no center that transformed and expanded as the scientists who worked on it and inhabited certain rooms made both structural and superficial changes. Oppenheimer considered the scientists' work heroic because they built into the unknown and there was always a danger that as they worked on the high scaffolding, they might come tumbling down. At one point in this radio broadcast, Oppenheimer made it clear that he would not have placed table ways of knowing within his house called science. He described the loneliness of scientists working on the frontiers of knowledge and contrasted that with the idea of the primitive village. He remarked, quote, Perhaps in the village, men were not so lonely. Perhaps they found in each other a fixed community, a fixed and only slowly growing store of knowledge, a single world. He was unsure of this point, but he pressed no further. And here I want to transition to a Tewa perspective. In the Tewa language, there is no word for science. But Oppenheimer's metaphor of the house raises the possibility of using Tewa architecture to think about science and its meaning on the Pajarito Plateau. Now this is a very personal turn for me to take. Those of you familiar with the work of my grandmother, Rena Swensel, will know that she was an architect and that much of her philosophy came from thinking and writing about houses and structures of Tewa villages. Part of this reflection involved memories and moments from her childhood in the 1940s so using her work and these moments of growing up in Santa Clara, which were simultaneous to the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos, we can start to imagine a conversation between Western science and Tewa ways of knowing. Three stories or images stand out to me that I'd like to share from my grandmother's experience. The first is that my grandmother described wandering through the Pueblo on her way home from the day school and tasting houses on her way back with her friends. This was a regular activity. The houses were built from surrounding organic materials, and they seemed to be a part of the environment itself. But each house had a different taste, almost like personalities. 
The houses were also built next to each other in a way that both encompassed the plaza and echoed the surrounding hills and mountains. As structures, they were part of a circular transference of energy that focused on the centers or plazas of the table world. The sense that my grandmother got from growing up in this setting was of warmth and containment and a sense of being held both by the individual houses and by the way they were built together. There's one more story she told about noticing a crack in the wall of one house and seeing it grow bigger every day. She went home to her great grandmother and asked why nothing was being done and her grandmother told her, that's none of your concern. It has been a good house, it has healed and been healed and now it is time for it to return to the earth. The house did eventually fall down and that was okay because it was part of the natural cycle of the house's life. To me, what is striking about these stories is that the houses in the Pueblo come across as living beings. They echoed and took part in their larger surroundings, and they were built in relation to one another in a way that contained the Pueblo and focused energies inward. And this centered inwardness is probably the greatest difference that I see between the Pueblo House and Oppenheimer's House of Science, which constantly expanded into the frontier of the unknown. And it's the encounter between these two houses, these two ways of knowing that clash on the Parito Plateau that I'm really very interested in. If we take this contrast of houses to a fundamental level, we might ask, how does a circular and inwardly directed world or society, the Tewa Pueblo world, encounter one that is progressively expanding? And what I hope to show is that Tewa Pueblo patterns continue to work as a dynamic that brings external things and newcomers inward, accommodating and incorporating them. And that this pattern is at the heart of the amazingly successful survival and persistence of Pueblo communities. To wrap up this point, I wanna come back to my grandmother one last time. In the introduction of her PhD dissertation, she wrote that, quote, writing and analyzing our methods of the Western European world and our antithetical to Pueblo existence. Which is a little funny to me because she was a Pueblo person conducting analysis and earning a doctorate in American studies. What I wanna suggest or what I wanna take away from this paradox is that when we take seriously the inward circular dynamic of Tewa society, reflected in the shattering and rebirth theme and in the newcomer motif and in the houses and architecture, perhaps there could be nothing more Tewa than accommodating writing and analysis into Pueblo modes of being and understanding. Uh, thank you everybody once again for listening. Thank you very much for that, Dimitri. Before, Before we, we go, go to the, uh, the questions that are coming in and the, the Q&A, I have one for you. So the, the, the table of Pueblo is actually, I presume that when Los Alamos was founded um, or created, it, parts of it do impinge upon Tewa lands, isn't that the case? Sure, so on the question of land, most of the land that the Manhattan Project claimed on the Pajarito Plateau was land owned by homesteaders, um, Hispano and Anglo homesteaders, mostly Hispano, and also the Los Alamos Ranch School. They did uh, carve into San Ildefonso lands a bit and some of Santa Clara lands, but it was it was um, on a, on a peripheral edge. The question though is interesting because I think that relationships to land table pueblo relationships um, with land I think go deeper go beyond kind of uh, what we might think of as like typical property rights. There are of course relationships that the table pueblos maintained with ancestral sites on the Pajarito Plateau and the way that the world is considered those hills leading up to the Hamas mountain range um, were important components to their world whether or not they had you know ownership uh, or title to those lands. Um, so but that raises an interesting question because one of the core messages is this interesting, 
um, blend of accommodation on the one hand and resistance on the other. And obviously the resistance um, was demonstrated when, when Hewitt was excavating uh, on Tewa land and also when the proposal for uh, you know, the, the, the uh, dam and excavations related to that. So was there something different uh, about the creation of Los Alamos that led to a willingness to entertain that? Or was it simply patriotism? Or did the government just marshal um, you know, power that intimidated the community leaders at the time? The government certainly marshaled uh, power and they had the funds to do what they what they wanted. Certainly there were protests from the from Hispano homesteaders whose land uh, was taken over in the Los Alamos Ranch School itself. You know, they under the, the leaders of the ranch school understood why the land was being taken over. Um, you know, not in detail, but they the, the idea of the war effort, everybody at this time is making sacrifices for the war effort. I'm not quite so sure that I would call it patriotism per se, but um, there's, there's so much going on at this time, uh, especially, you know, considering the dam hearing in 1943 that the Pueblo leaders had to focus on, um, that the idea of an entity taking over what had been this ranch school and putting fences around it. Um, there is also the, so I see another question about the idea of permanence. There wasn't, there wasn't necessarily the sense that Los Alamos or the Manhattan Project would become this permanent installation like it, like it did, like it has. Thank you for that. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, respond. I'll pose some of the questions coming in. We've got a lot of them. Um, first one is from an anonymous attendee. I'd like to hear more about what you think about the idea of time and the parallel universes that existed uh, between Los Alamos and, and the Tewa Te Pueblos. Mm -hmm. So, the, so the, the first thing that comes to mind, of course, is just the really interesting contrast between the, you know, a really deep seated idea in the Tewa Pueblos of uh, cyclical time, seasonal time, um, in, in a way that contrasts with the common Western conception of time that moves forward, that progresses in a linear fashion. Um, you also have, you know, the, the idea of time is also resonant in the fact that scientists were working with the physicists at the, on the Manhattan Project were working with um, equations and uh, elements that were uh, atoms that were supposed to interact nearly instantaneously, about as small a, a, a chunk of time that we can imagine. At the same time, you have the idea of radioactivity um, and these uh, effects of what, um, the effects of atomic science that will linger uh, far, far into the future for many thousands of years after we're all uh, after we're all not here anymore. But the idea of time is also, it, the idea of simultaneity, these things happening at the same time, thinking about, you know, my grandmother's growing up in the Pueblo and her siblings growing up in the Pueblo in the 1940s, what the Pueblo was like then at the same time that um, Los Alamos and the Manhattan Project are going on and what that contrast looked like. Uh, the idea of the stories of Montezuma and the railroad, uh, that engine being called Montezuma, that's another sort of parallel. Uh, something that I'm working through right now is, is, is an idea um, that I kind of got from Vine Deloria Jr. who wrote a book about Carl Jung and the relationship between Carl Jung's philosophies and uh, Sioux traditions. And something that comes out of that book is the idea of synchronicity or a causal parallelisms that reveal uh, deeper layers of meaning. And I, I won't say too much more, um, but there is the idea that table philosophical concepts exist at the same time as atomic physics. And what could it mean uh, to bring these two things into dialogue with each other? It's a uh, the idea or the possibility of dialogue is exciting to me.
Great. There's a question from Flannery. Um, this project is super exciting. I look forward to following it. Would you speak more about the content, sorry, the context of the quote you used about wholeness and how wholeness is shaping your work? So the idea of holes, uh, that, is, that is the quote. I think you're referencing the quote that my grandmother, um, from my grandmother about holes and needing to think of things as holes. Um, this, this relates to the project in that, you know, thinking of a hole, we might think of the, um, of atomic physics, of the Manhattan Project and the Teo Pueblos as existing um, in a whole together and in, in a way that we can bring both things into dialogue with each other. Uh, it also helps us think about, I mean, the, the, the reason why that quote is really like um, stimulating for me is that it relates to Oppenheimer's idea so well. Um, he was, he had been part of the generation of physicists working through the idea that, um, you know, early quantum physics, that you could have a particle on one hand and a wave on the other. And how do we reconcile these two things? And Oppenheimer's way of reconciling these, these two ideas, these mutually contradictory ways of thinking about physical experience was by um, expanding the framework and by thinking of things in terms of complementarity. Uh, and that, that's why I think my grandmother's quote about holes uh, helps, helps link up with the idea of um, complementarity in atomic physics. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, my understanding, or says, my understanding is that Los Alamos was not initially meant to be a permanent settlement. Do you have any sense of whether or not this was known by your grandmother or other relatives at the time? That's right. Well, um, so my grandmother would have been a child, of course, but I think that right. at the time, uh, the Pueblo, Pueblo leaders had no reason, nor anybody, nobody at Los Alamos either really thought that this would be a permanent settlement. Um, but kind of the global, global context and rising tensions after World War II led, uh, led many to believe that what that Los Alamos here we here at Los Alamos we already have an establishment that's working towards atomic weapons which are now going to be vital parts or components of world politics so let's just keep it and make it a permanent um, a permanent establishment but nobody at the time knew that it would be permanent the idea that it was that it would be temporary to, to your knowledge were there Taiwan people who refused to work at the labs because they felt that it impinged upon their land rights or their political sovereignty? In terms of land rights and political sovereignty, I haven't come across that sense very strongly, but there are certainly many other reasons why uh, Teo Pueblos would not have wanted to work at Los Alamos. Mm -hmm. um, just scrolling down, let's see, there was Echo, here we go. Uh, Awanda Trebethan says, it, it, it seems to me that you're uniquely positioned to do this work. Can you comment on how your heritage influences your ability to, to conduct your research? Yeah, um, I, I do think in some ways I'm uniquely positioned for this, uh, but at the same time, I, I think you know, there, there's something very special that feels uh, really purposeful and meaningful about writing what I consider to be my home community in many senses, when we're talking about Santa Clara, especially. Uh, but it also leads to, you know, conflict as well. There's, there's, there's not necessarily, it's not an easy thing to try to write a history about um, about a Tewa Pueblo community and to try to do it justice in the way that I think it deserves. Um, of, of course, you know, drawing on family stories and meeting people and uh, more extended relatives in the, in the Pueblos um, through my great aunts and uncles has been an incredible experience. Um, but that's been mostly about kind of the, the sort of forming of relationships on an individual level um, I think that all those, all these relationships like that sit kind of in the back of my head um, as I move forward, but 
and, and of course they influence the work and how I write about it and how I'm trying to think about it. Um, but I, you know, I, I recognize the, the, the fortune of having a connection to Santa Clara and trying to do this history with that connection, but um, it's, not, it's not always easy, nor should it be, nor is any scholarship. One of those attendees says, great work. I had the pleasure of meeting your grandmother and appreciate your reflections on her work. Uh, I imagine that the real purposes and studies at Los Alamos were never discussed with leaders. I appreciate that you said the environmental aspects were not part of your study, but the eventual uranium mining seems to have uh, another high impact and toll on Pueblo peoples, almost a third commodification with science and traditional worlds. Is this outside your thesis? Is this, in other words, is this a topic you're going to address in your dissertation? Yeah. So if we're just talking about framing. This is a topic that is uh, obviously very related, relevant to the work that I'm doing. But as I'm conceiving the project, at least at this point in the dissertation phase, that is um, beyond the scope of the work, both Pueblo, the repercussions of uranium mining in uh, Navajo country and for Pueblo people. Mm. There's a question from Ellen Bradbury Reed. Hi, nice to hear from you, Ellen. As a child growing up in Los Alamos, I wanted to learn Tewa. There are stories from scientists, scientists' wives who had Tewa maids and the relationships were in my memory pretty strong. I'd love to share some of the stories from the point of view as a child of that time and place and the importance of the Tewa. So did, did, were there comments? I mean, you might wanna meet with um, Ellen offline to talk about that, but- Yeah, I, I, th thank you. Thank you, Ellen, for the- um, for that comment, I would love to hear those stories. Uh, and anybody who wants to reach out afterwards, please feel free to do so. I'd love to hear from as many of you as uh, want to reach out. Uh, Norm asks, how much do you see the accommodation slash adaptation as an integral part of Tewa culture, separate from the importance of such behavior as critical to survival in an encroaching world? Uh, was it just a... Uh, I guess I would rephrase that saying, was it just pragmatism in the face of this overwhelming power or is it really an essential part, you know, a sort of deep structure of Tewa understanding? My argument is that it's, it's an integral part, that it's a deep structure, that it's an inherent pattern, um, that this pattern of accommodation is, we, we can see it in so many cases of Pueblo life and in Pueblo ceremony, um, in Pueblo storytelling, in architecture, in, um, in pottery, in the coils of the pottery, in the designs, the cyclical designs on, um, on, on petroglyphs. There's just a, there's, there's something that, to me anyways, becomes so clear about the way the Pueblo world is able to bring things inward, that that, that, that is a, a critical pattern essential to, um, you know, Pueblo survival and ways of being that is, uh, that goes beyond like a, a more practical, pragmatic, you know, trying to survive in the day to day by ad adapting certain things here and there. I see it as a more ingrained pattern. Thank you, Norm, for the question. Did, did, uh, just as, a, as an addition to that or going beyond that, to, to tell you what people, I mean, I know it's a case that Hopi and some other Pueblo peoples really see their communities as consisting of groups that came together. So they have distinct identities. I mean, Tewa Pueblo or Tewa Village or Hano at, uh, at Hopi is a perfect example. Is that, is that true? And is that consistent? Is that true for the Rio Grande Tewa? And is that consistent with your thinking about it? Absolutely. Uh, like this pattern, it, it goes back to those, you know, what, what archaeologists and what origin myth kind of stories tell too about different groups of people kind of coming together. Sometimes there's breaking offs, but many times it's different people, different peoples coming together and forming villages um, in certain places. It's also part of that, part of the movement of Tewa um, history and migration of, of coming around and finding, a, finding that center. Uh, that center place. Mm. There's a question from Rosalind Hunter Anderson. She says, have you, have you read Stallion Gate by Martin Cruz Smith, who's part Tewa? Uh, um, many of the issues you raise are also raised in this book of historical fiction. Uh, thank you for the recommendation. I, I <laughs> can't wait to get my hands on it. Yeah. Uh, here's a comment from uh, one of your fellow scholars, Ben Young. 
Um, great presentation. He says, I'm thinking about your observations of, about the tendency of Tewa recollections to end narratively or temporarily at the establishment of Los Alamos. The notion of remembering or recollecting gets complicated since we're talking about remembering something that one didn't have real information on at the time. Are you following this? So it's a form of remembering that's different from simply accessing memories of things that happened. This raises the question of how and when your informants or interlocutors became aware of Los Alamos National Laboratory and what was happening there. So I guess it's retrospectively, you know, knowing what terrible power was unleashed by what was happening, did that change sort of retrospectively the community's thinking or re remembering of, of, of the Los Alamos period during World War II? It's a, it's, I think that I'm, I'm still taking a moment to try to process the question. Um, the idea of a retrospective, of a retrospective prophecy, I think is a, is a pretty common theme in um, native storytelling that it doesn't, it, it's, it's a really interesting question. It doesn't diminish, I don't think, the power of those types of retrospective um, prophecies or the fact that people moving forward are making meaning in this way. Um, but the, the notion of remembering or recollecting, right, so um, the, the, the recollections, I, so in this specific case, I think that Ben is talking about like the, the recollection what is real? I'm not sure, maybe that didn't come across in the presentation and maybe I'm not answering this question uh, in the right way, but the, 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 recoll the ends of recollections that I'm talking about are people telling stories, you know, their childhoods, maybe they grow growing up in the 1920s, 1930s, taking part in uh, dances, taking up jobs here and there. And then when they get to Los Alamos, they stop like this as part of the as part of you know the interview. They just once they get to Los Alamos, that's there. It's almost like there's no more. There's nothing more to tell after that. In a in a sort of interesting kind of end kind of way. Um, well, I guess what I, what I'm thinking in relation to Ben's question is. You know, Oppenheimer made the famous quote when after the Trinity explosion, you know, and that the gadget actually worked, that he invokes this, you know, South Asian myth, mythology, sort of apocalyptic imagery. Did, did Tewa people talk about the bomb as, as some kind of um, power that, you know, destructive power that has a place in mythology or, or was prophesied in, in, in mythology? Not in a clear, not in a clear way that I've been able to find, but I think that part of what I have been able to find in Tewa's story is that these, is that patterns in them, patterns in Tewa's story, patterns in recollections map on very well to uh, other ideas, like how we can use Montezuma and Montezuma's prophecy of the railroad to think about the Manhattan Project as well, and that these stories can kind of encapsulate uh, meanings that are made, but not in a direct way, uh, Michael. I don't think that the that the atomic bomb then became, you know, sort of mythologized in Tewa's story. There are certainly, I mean, of of course, Tewa people after the Trinity test site and after Hiroshima and Nagasaki realized what had happened um, and felt you know, however you could imagine human beings would feel about having been part of or close to the project that made atomic weapons a reality. There are a lot of comments here that just express a petri uh, appreciation for your talk and make some observations about it. I'm just gonna focus on the ones that are more interrogative that are questions. So Thomas asks, what, what's been the impact of the Tewa Pub on the Tewa Pueblos of the loss of lands appropriated by Los Alamos National Lab in Los Alamos County, particularly San Aldefonso and Santa Clara. I don't know, Jemez has presumably been affected too, though they're not, not Tewa. Yeah. So I think that this, this has changed historically. I think initially there, you know, the clearest implication was that Tewa people, uh, Tewa leaders, spiritual leaders couldn't access 
sites that were important to go to um, because Los Alamos had, or yeah, Los Alamos had built fences around, um, around the territory. Uh, there, there have been more recent conversations between the Pueblos and Los Alamos. I think in many cases, these conversations are kept private, uh, but they deal with the relationship between the laboratory, the land, and San Odefonso and Santa Clara's claims or um, spiritual relationships to the land. Uh, that that doesn't feel like a very satisfying answer, <laughs> perhaps, but uh, hopefully I got a little bit to what you're talking about. I'm trying to read the follow-up comment as well. I know it's complicated, and I'm looking at the chat uh, chat panel right now, which does have some questions um, from Brian Smith. Here's one that says, "I suspect that the Pueblo people." Uh, had they known the scope of the Manhattan Project, they would have objected. As Los Alamos exists today, there is now a synergy. Is, is there a sense of co cooperation or is it just a kind of necessary evil? It's a really interesting question. I think that, I think, you know, based on what we find from the dam hearing, which took place in 1943, in the same year that the Manhattan Project came to the Parito Plateau, it, it would not be very difficult to assume that Pueblo leaders, Pueblo people, generally table people would have um, opposed the lab's presence um, for, for a number of reasons. Um, there was a second part of that question that I am blanking on, I think. Is there now a sense of Co cooperation or oh, yeah. synergy. I mean, I presume that because so many people work there, it is a, an economic uh, reality for the community. Yeah, so many people work at Los Alamos. It's become a central economic uh, presence in the region. Um, there's, there's, there's no getting around that. You, you can, you can not, you know, you can recognize what Los Alamos is doing environmentally, what the Manhattan Project did environmentally and historically. At the same time, you also need to, you know, get up each day and support your family and going to Los Alamos can help you do that. Right. And helps many Pueblo people do that. Uh, John has a comment and he says, thank, thank you very much. Can you say more about the interplay of accommodation and resistance? We talked about that a bit, but you might want to, uh, expand on it. You emphasized the Tewa capacity for accommodation, but did you see any particular styles or modes of resistance among the Tewa? I'm thinking to a possible parallels or differences with Oppenheimer's later resistance and second thoughts about the bomb he helped to create. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that there, so the first thing that comes to mind, I mean, the, the one thing I really would like to say about accommodation and resistance is that I, I, I really don't wanna think about them as these opposing poles. Like on one hand you have indigenous resistance and on the other hand you have indigenous accommodation. I think that often we tend to think about those two terms, those two ideas in a certain dichotomy. And I think mm -hmm. that what resistance means um, can be, uh, this sounds silly, but can be accommodated by accommodation. Um, accommodation can be the strongest form of resistance. That's not necessarily, that's not a new idea, um, but it's something that I think is at the heart of what I'm trying to present. I think that in terms of resistance uh, to the Manhattan Project, during the Manhattan Project, which also relates to one question that I'm seeing further down from um, Matt Smart, uh, hi Matt, about have you found any personal stories of Tewa people having direct interactions or dialogues with Oppenheimer during or after the Manhattan Project? Um, so the maids that worked for physicists were, were very much doing the work on their own terms and would choose to, for the physicist families, uh, they would do the, they could choose to go to work, they could choose not to go to work and they mm -hmm. did so based on their own needs in the Pueblo. Um, one maid in particular worked for Robert Oppenheimer and described feeling 
you know, the stress and anxiety in his home and decided that she didn't, she didn't want to be around that stressful, anxious environment. She sympathized with the man or she said that she sympathized with him, um, especially after under, especially after learning what he was doing and about the project. But at that moment, because of the environment in his house, she decided to um, quit to leave her job. Uh, and I, you know, maybe you wouldn't call that resistance, but for some reason, that's the first thing that comes to mind is that is the, the power that the agency and the power that the maids had to interact with these people, the scientists and their families or not. There's a final question here where we should probably wrap. Um, when will your thesis be made available to the world? <laughs> um, I, well, I think that I will be done with the dissertation in June, by June. Um, Wonderful. And then after that, you know, we'll, we'll see how the, you know, publication processes work out, but yeah. Well, Dimitri Brown, thanks for an unforgettable talk. We'll see you at the next Scholar Colloquium. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody, for listening.